Okay, um, welcome everybody to the uh, latest uh, and final um, webinar in the series uh, organized by the Economic Research Forum and the World Bank uh, to discuss issues around um, data and transparency in the Middle East and North Africa region. My name is Ramesh Vaitalingam uh, and I'm, a, uh, I'm an economics writer and uh, communications consultant but based in uh, the UK. So it's 3 p.m. for me here. It's uh, 4 p.m. in Cairo. And I think for our three panelists, uh, it's 10 a.m. in the morning. They're all on the east coast of, uh, of the Americas. Um, so the uh, topic we're going to be discussing today is measuring monetary po poverty, data gaps, and alternatives to overcome them. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome from the World Bank as our uh, uh, introductory speaker, Aziz Atamanov, who is a senior economist in the Poverty Global Practice Group at the World Bank. Um, Aziz will um, start with a 20-minute uh, presentation, no more, he promises me. Uh, and then we will hear from our two discussants. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome from Virginia Tech uh, University in the United States, uh, Javad Salahi Isfahani who is originally from Iran and has written about uh, issues around poverty and many other issues in, in the region. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, post um, uh, links to uh, all our panelists, incidentally, in the chat so you can uh, find out a little bit more about them. And our second discussant will be uh, Paul Matisi, who's joining us from the University of Ottawa, and he's a uh, longtime associate of the uh, Economic Research Forum. Um, and the editor of the Journal of Economic Inequality, and he leads on these issues for the for the ERF. Both of them are contributors to uh, the Forum, which is a website that um, I was involved in establishing uh, three years ago as a, as a policy portal for uh, discussion of issues around uh, economic uh, and social policy, with and linking researchers and, and policymakers. And both Paul and Javad have contributed to that. And Aziz has an article just appeared in the last couple of days, which summarizes uh, the kind of things that he's going to be talking about uh, uh, today. So let me uh, just talk you through the plan. As I say, Jav um, Aziz will talk for about 20 minutes, then we'll have about 10 minutes each from Javad and Paul, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Now, there are a couple of ways um, uh, listeners, viewers can uh, join in the conversation. So if you go to the bottom of your, uh, your uh, Zoom screen, you'll see a button called Q&A. And if you click on that, you have the opportunity to type in a question uh, and uh, uh, any of our panelists could respond either by typing there or they can uh, feature it in their, in their uh, audio presentation. The alternative way is if you look at the list of participants, uh, you'll see yourselves all there and there's a feature called raise hand and you can click on that and that will indicate to me and my uh, ERF colleagues that you would like to uh, join the conversation um, and, and we can set that up to uh, to happen. So uh, bear those bear those opportunities in mind and I will now hand over to uh, Aziz to uh, make his opening presentation. Aziz over to you. So it's my pleasure to present uh, results from our paper, uh, Measuring Monetary Poverty in the MENA Region, Data Gaps and Different Options to Address Them. Uh, so the paper was co-authored with Shara Tenden, Gladys Lopez Azevedo, and Mexico Bajena. Uh, uh, the outline of the presentation, uh, next slide please. So the outline of the presentation basically follows the paper. Uh, I will start from talking about importance of household budget surveys uh, then I will show you some empirical evidence on the, of the issues related to availability, access, and timeliness of the household budget service in the region. And then I will talk about the ways to close the gap. And I will try to distinguish the cases uh, when countries can uh, collect household budget service data and when countries cannot collect household budget uh, data. Next slide, please. Okay, I don't think I, 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 I have to spend a lot of time here because I'm sure you know that uh, household budget surveys uh, collect extensive expenditure and consumption data. So they are key uh, for measuring and tracking monetary poverty at the country, regional and global levels. Uh, on top of this, household budget surveys 
is collect information on other indicators like access to education, labor market assets, housing conditions. So they can be also used to track different indicators like SDGs. They can also help governments to provide empirical basis for government policies, both at the national and regional levels. And finally, given that in household budget service we have poverty status and we also know individual household characteristics, we can use this information to establish relationship between them. Uh, let me show you uh, one illustrative example uh, how household budget surveys are important for the World Bank. I'm sure you know that one of the World Bank goal is to eradicate extreme poverty. And the way we measure it, we calculate extreme poverty um, for each country and then we aggregate up. Uh, and there are two conditions for us uh, to be able to report regional poverty. So the first one is uh, country surveys should cover more than 40% of total regional population. So World Bank can uh, report the regional poverty rate. Additionally, the surveys uh, should be conducted roughly within two years of the reference period. So currently the reference period uh, World Bank is using is 2018. So any survey which is conducted before 2016 will not be counted for the coverage. So two important conditions. And here is uh, on the screen, you can see the screenshot. The screenshot is from the World Bank PAFCALNET page. You see the regions, you see the poverty line, headcount, poverty gap, number of poor population, and the last column shows you survey coverage. So you can see that currently, World Bank cannot report poverty for South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason is because the coverage is too low. You see it's below 40%, it's the last column. Uh, and look at the Middle East and North Africa. So the current coverage is 50%. So basically uh, we can we cover 50% of population with the current surveys, most recent surveys. Uh, we are able we are able to report the number, but here is the, the most important caveat, caveat is that the coverage depends a lot on the survey. So for example, if we drop Egypt 2017 survey, for example, uh, uh, this data is not shared, the coverage will drop dramatically to 23% and we will not be able to report many regional poverty number. So you can clearly see how important for us to have access to household budget surveys regular household budget service. Next slide, please. So let me uh, let me walk you through some empirical evidence on, of the current issues in MENA. And let me start from the very simple figure, basically showing uh, GDP per capita on the horizontal axis and average statistical capacity in each region in the world, measured by the World Bank. So. Uh, MENA is a green dot, so you can clearly see that MENA is a kind of outlier. Uh, with a GDP per capita on average around 13,000, uh, 2011 PPP dollars, the statistical capacity in, in the region is very low. It is actually very close to Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you repeat the same figure for 2018, 2019 year, the figure, the, the situation will be even worse. So MENA will have statistical capacity lower than the Africa. Why it happens? Uh, I will show you. So partially it is related to uh, poor availability of household budget service. So uh, the figure on the screen shows you the distribution of countries uh, by availability of household budget service during 2004-2018. Uh, so for each region you see how many countries collected, collected, not collected but had three or more data points how many countries had one or two data point and how many countries did not have any data for the last 15 years. You can clearly see that MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa are outliers. So for example, in, in MENA, almost 50% uh, of the population come from the data deprived countries, which collected data only once or two during 15 years. Uh, besides availability of the household budget service, timeliness of the data is very important, especially in many where situation changes dramatically from year to year. So the next figure on the right shows you the distribution of the most recent household budget service, again in each region. Again, the green bar kind of uh, the best outcome. Uh, it shows you the, the share of service which are collected in 2015-2018. Uh, the orange bar shows you 
the share of surveys collected in 2010-2014, and the red bar, bar is the worst outcome, very old data collected in 2006-2009. And again, you see that MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa are two outliers, and actually MENA is even worse than the Africa. So, for example, 15% of all surveys, of all most recent surveys in the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, were collected in 2006 and 2009. So, making data extremely old and outdated. Next slide, please. Let me also talk about other issues. So, the, besides availability and timeliness, for, our, for, for any person who wants to do analysis, having comparable data is very important. So the country may have 10 household budget surveys, but if none of them are comparable, you cannot do much. Uh, so in the region, in, 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 in MENA, from 13 MENA developing countries, four have breaks and series, and three do not have even two comparable points. And for other countries, data is extremely old. Here I want to make a caveat. Uh, some countries, have non-comparable series because they want to improve their service or improve their poverty methodology. So it's not it's not always a bad thing to have non-comparable series, but it seriously limits your ability to conduct analysis. Uh, the second issue in the region is that you still have countries which do not share household budget service at all. So you can see it from the table. On the left, you see countries which share partially or fully household budget service, and uh, the column in the middle shows you countries which you do not share. They don't provide public access to household budget service. This is Algeria, Jordan, and Lebanon. And the last issue, which is also important, is that for some countries, it takes so much time to, uh, to come from the data collection to poverty measurement and publishing the microdata. Uh, I, there is one country in the region uh, which conducted survey in 2014, but it took, it took the country, it took uh, publish the poverty number in two years, and in next two years they, they uh, publish the data. So basically, it took the country four years. It took four years between uh, data collection and between data collection and publishing the data. And of course, if you publish the data with such a lack, the data is outdated. Next slide, please. So let's let's switch to uh, to the ways how to close the data gap. And let's start uh, from the case where countries where countries have household budget surveys or household budget surveys can be collected. So the answer is very easy and a kind of trivial. So your country needs to conduct more household budget surveys. And here international organizations can 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 help. And how can, how can they help? Uh, so first of all, uh, if you could click, please. Yes, so we can we can enhance capacity of statistical agencies and provide funds to collect household budget service more regularly. Also, we can provide technical assistance and, and help countries to share data because some countries are afraid to share microdata because of the privacy issues. So we can help them showing the techniques, how to anonymize the data, how to publish the data, how to create data catalogs. And finally, we can also help to measure poverty. So it does not need to take one year to measure poverty. Uh, with, with, the, with the good techniques and everything, you can, you can do it in two or three months after the data collection. Uh, so imagine uh, household budget service cannot be collected for any reason, but you still want to measure monetary poverty. How can you do it? So there is only one option only one approach, imputation, survey to survey imputation. So the way it works the following. Uh, you need to have one household budget survey with consumption. You create a consumption model, and then you impute using this consumption model, consumption to another survey, which is much smaller, and only collects correlates of poverty. So you have two options. Uh, you can either collect a short survey with consumption correlates, or you can use labor force survey, for example, existing service without consumption. There are two necessary conditions. Of course, you need to have a recent household budget survey with consumption data to create a model, first of all. Secondly, variables used in the model should be defined and have the same distribution as variables in the survey you are going to impute your consumption. And finally, which is also very important, 
when you when you create your model and use it, the assumption is that st coefficients are stable, but it's not always the case, especially in the case of conflicts, in the case of, in the case of COVID. I'm not sure the model which was created in 2020 will work in 2021 because of the COVID. But let, uh, let us quickly check if we can impute consumption um, in the MENA region using labor force service. So the figure on the right just shows you existing labor force service in the MENA region to the best of our knowledge. And of course, there are countries which don't, do not collect labor force service, and there are countries which collect labor force service. So for some of them, like Iran, Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, you have both household budget service and labor force service. So theoretically, you can test and try to impute consumption and see how it works. Of course, as I said, for many countries, imputation is not possible because there are no recent household budget service. For example, in Algeria, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and as I already said, following COVID, imputation may not be feasible at all. There is one way to overcome it, but if, if I have time, I will, I will show you later. Okay, let, let me also uh, walk you through other approaches. So again, this is approaches when you don't have household budget service and you cannot collect them. This is very heavy slide, so uh, let me walk you through. Um, let's go uh, row by row. So the first approach is to construct multidimensional poverty index. And I should say that even if you have household budget survey, and if you if country calculated monetary poverty, it's always useful to calculate MPI if possible, because it, it gives you slightly different perspective, focusing on non-monetary non poverty dimensions. And in MENA, uh, what was done, uh, researchers typically use mix or DHS service because in order to construct MPI, it's a very data-intensive uh, um, process. You need to have all deprivations in the same database. So people use mix and DHS. The problem with this approach uh, that mix surveys are typically conducted only once in four years. Uh, and if you, if you can click on the arrow, Uh, no, if you can go back, please. Uh, you see the arrow on the right, the small arrow. No, no. Uh, it's fine. No worries. My, what what I wanted to say is that um, if you if you look how many mixed surveys are available in the region, uh, there are only handful of countries which have conducted mixed surveys recently. So this approach makes sense, but in many countries it will not be possible because they don't have recent mixed survey. So uh, the next uh, the next approach, no, no, please, could you please stay on this slide? It's, it's heavy, so I will tell you when, when, when to change it. Uh, so the next approach is to use phone surveys and to measure food security and vulnerability. Uh, and phone surveys become very popular right now because probably this is the best option for rapid assessment and conflict affected settings and during the COVID because you cannot do face-to-face -face surveys. And World Bank is currently supporting phone surveys almost in all countries in the world. Uh, the disadvantage or limitation of this approach is the following that uh, phone surveys are typically very short. It should not last more than 15, 20 minutes. So the question questionnaire is quite short and uh, you cannot ask many questions. Of course, you cannot measure poverty by using this instrument. And another, another uh, disadvantage is that phone survey will cover only phone using population. And even though in MENA phone penetration, mobile phone penetration is quite high, it can be a problem because you can, you can miss some marginalized groups of people. So another approach is, again, to measure subjective well-being or food security by public opinion surveys. And by public opinion surveys, I mean surveys like Gallup or Arab Barometer. Advantage of it is that these surveys are readily available, and some of them are free. You can just download Arab Barometer survey and use it. The issue with this service is that quality may vary from country to country a lot, depending on the firm which conducts the survey. Uh, if you can also use administrative data, administrative data is readily available 
you will not have to spend anything. So you can, if you get, if you get access to it, you can use it immediately. The, 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 the main problem with the administrative data is that you have zero control over population included. So for example, if you are interested in informal workers and you are using tax records, they, they, these guys will be excluded from your, from your database. And the last, the last approach is to use geospatial data. Uh, when, I, when I say geospatial data, uh, I, I mean satellite images showing precipitation, roof structure, whatever. The main advantage of this data is that it is available at the lowest level of disaggregation. So it's very, it's very useful. But the key problem with this data is that it's super useful when you combine it with HBS. When you have consumption data, when you merge your household budget surveys with geospatial data, you can, for example, improve, improve your imputation a lot. So that's probably the main uh, disadvantage. And also this data can be also expensive and require technical skills. Thank you, Seth. Next slide, please. So what we did at the end of the paper, we looked at all approaches I just uh, explained to you and described and to apply, we try to think how these approaches will work in every MENA country. And uh, the figure shows you the following. Uh, the color of the square shows you how relevant and feasible approach is for any country. So dark green means that approach is very relevant and feasible. The light color means that it's less, uh, uh, less relevant and feasible and the gray color tells you that this approach is not applicable at all. So let me just show you one example, let me walk you through one example. Let's look at Algeria, for example. So you know in Algeria, the latest survey was conducted in 2011. So for us, it was kind of very clear that uh, having a new household budget survey should be a top priority. And it seems to be relevant and feasible. So that's why they put a green color for the HBS. Imputation is not feasible at all because you cannot impute consumption using survey conducted in 2011 because your model is completely outdated. We also know that in Algeria has mixed survey conducted in 2019, 19, if I'm not mistaken. So that's why we put a little bit lighter square, green square for MPI. Also Algeria have, has ARA barometer conducted in 2019. So that's why we've put another slight uh, lighter green square for food security subjective well-being. Uh, in many countries, conflict affected countries like Syria, Libya, we think that using big data makes more sense and, and more feasible and reasonable. But still, if you count the number of green squares, the largest number you will get uh, for the HBS column, as you can see. So we, we strongly believe that Focusing on collecting uh, new household budget service more regularly is very important for the region. Could you please switch to the next slide? Aziz, if you could draw to a close now. Ah, perfect. Conclusions. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm trying to be, yeah. Thank you. To stick to my word, yeah. yeah. So conclusions are very simple. I, I showed you that MENA region is facing substantial issues related to availability and timeliness of household budget service. Priority, if possible, regular collection of household budget service and improving quality and access to existing service. If new household budget service are not possible to collect, you have a range of techniques you can use. You can use imputation, you can construct MPI, whatever, but it's important to be aware of uh, advantages and disadvantages of each approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aziz. And, uh... You survived the technical difficulties at the beginning. I made sure you still got your full, uh, full allotment of time. Thank, thanks very much for that presentation. So um, there are a couple of comments in the Q&A, but let me remind you that that's a way that you can, uh, you can contribute to the discussion by uh, typing something in there. Um, and or the other way is to raise your hand. I already see a hand raised. But first of all, we're gonna to come to our two discussants. And first of all, Javad, uh, I'm gonna hand over to you and you have uh, 10 minutes for your response. I think you have some slides as well. So. I do. Over to you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here and discuss this very interesting, important paper by uh, Aziz and his 
uh, colleagues, a very distinguished team that he has put together, and this is a valuable paper. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh... Right, so obviously the paper is an important contribution to the intersection of data on poverty analysis. It assesses a statistical capacity of men or countries for provision of data needed for poverty analysis. Uh, and I was a bit surprised by how bad MENO is doing, even though I've been involved in uh, data, working with data in MENO countries for a number of years. Uh, it is interesting uh, that at the time of COVID-19 and the pandemic, we are probably going to have harder time collecting face-to-face uh, -face data. So uh, it would be nice for the World Bank to uh, give advice to uh, statistical agencies of how to proceed. I'm sure they're all thinking about this, but it's not discussed in this paper. Uh, the paper concludes that the region is data deprived. I like that term actually, uh, and discusses how to close the gaps and presumably to improve poverty monitoring and poverty reduction. Though this particular link is not much discussed in the paper, and it's uh, something that I'd like to discuss. Uh, there's a very useful discussion of these uh, other methods of getting most out of what you have, survey to survey imputation, multidimensional poverty analysis, phone surveys, and big data, which I'm not going to comment on because uh, I'm not an expert in those areas. Uh, the paper is short on how data can contribute to the ultimate goal of poverty reduction. I know that's not the paper they wanted to write and it's a bad habit of discussions to say you should have written the paper I like, but uh, in, 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 in the spirit of broadening the discussion, getting it out of this very technical area of data availability to poverty analysis, uh, please indulge me for a few slides. If you move forward, please. Right, this particular uh, figure, figure four, caught my attention uh, that shows men or countries has actually decreased in capacity uh, to collect and present data. Uh, so I have no argument with the low availability, low production, low availability, low access of data in a number of countries, as we know, in most authoritarian countries is hard to get free access to data. Uh, but I do find it surprising that the capacity has actually gone down. And if you move forward uh, to my next slide. So there's something about the statistical capacity that I do not understand. Perhaps I'm thinking of data availability. And uh, since I've been involved since the 1990s in this issue of data, uh, I am old enough to remember very, very poor days in terms of data collection. So I'm kind of optimistic that things have improved and now I see uh, this graph and some comments in the paper that things are going the, the wrong way. Uh, I, I mean, Aziz is too young to remember the ERF World Bank Corporation in 1998 when uh, Raghi Asad in Santunali and I brought uh, researchers and statistical agency heads to uh, uh, Istanbul to discuss data and poverty analysis. Uh, and then again, we did that in 2000 in al Ahrawain in Morocco. Uh, we didn't get very far, but the idea of connecting researchers to statistical agencies was a focus of the ERF and the World Bank uh, at the time, Isak Diwan was a manager in the World Bank Institute and he was funding that effort. So I wish that be more uh, references in your paper to this effort. Uh, I was uh, dismayed that there was no reference to ERF uh, or the uh, uh, open uh, access micro data initiative that the ERF has uh, put in, for the last decade and it's been hugely successful in my view. 
uh, hundreds of papers and MA and masters and PhD theses have been written using uh, MENO surveys. I know they're not all HBS and they're not all about poverty, but how is it that the capacity index shows that MENO is doing worse when, at least from the point of view of research, researchers and young researchers, access to data has improved? Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, whether the statistical index that you're using is only on HBS, in which case maybe that's true, but if you're also including LFS, then it cannot be true. There's a puzzle at least for me. Next slide, please. So here's uh, now moving on to the link between data availability and poverty analysis. I just wanted to establish, these are two graphs that uh, Isak Diwan and I produced uh, as part of a study on inequality, autonomy, and change in the Arab world, which was an ESCOI study published in 2018. And on the left graph, you see average poverty rates uh, for the period 2005-2015, and uh, there is a estimated fitted curve to the global data, and what it shows is that MENA countries are about average given their GDP per capita. So in terms of poverty, they're not doing much worse than the rest of the world. This doesn't jive with the table uh, in the uh, paper that you saw, the first table you saw. Uh, I'm curious what explains that. These are data from WDI, World Bank's own data, uh, and poverty data sets. And if you look on the right-hand side graph, again, you see that if you look at the mean poverty rates for 1990 to 2000, and then uh, for the most recent years after 2005, you see that many countries, except for Yemen, they are all below the 45 degree line, meaning that poverty rates have dropped over time. And this is a period when data quality, according to the paper, has been going down and poverty has been improving. Next slide, please. So, Again, moving, I'm moving way beyond the paper, but I think it might be useful to, it enriches actually to have this perspective when you think about it, when you read the paper. Uh, so question is how do better data lead to poverty reduction? The paper's implicit view is that you get better data, uh, you get better poverty measurement, and then better policies come and poverty is reduced. I think a broader view should be you get better data, of course you get better poverty measurement, but then there is a political process uh, to identify the poor and design policies to assist them. That is probably where things are going wrong in the Middle East. And you know, if I'm correct, the data is becoming more available, but how are we going to deal with the other links? Uh, then you have policy and policy evaluation and lower poverty rates and all those, I think the development literature is very rich in. Uh, it's the political process to identify the poor and policies to a system where we are not very good as economists. Uh, previous slide, I'm not finished with the previous slide, just one more point. So for example, identifying the poor requires a lot more than survey data. Of course data can help, but we need to pay attention to what it requires to use the data not just for research and publishing papers, but also for improving poverty. That's the part that I am not, uh, uh, I'm not sure the paper is addressing, but I think somebody should address. Now the next slide, please. So what I did, uh, I des decided what, uh, to do something I told my students not to do, which is to run cross-country regressions. Uh, but when you have a metric, new metric especially, it's a time to run regressions. Like, so you have this statistical capacity for a hundred countries plus, and I thought I'll uh, decide, I, I'll, I'll regress poverty rates, headcount rates on log GDP per capita, years of schooling and the statistical capacity to see whether a statistical capacity jumps out as one of these big determinants of poverty rates. And using extreme poverty, poverty for lower middle income, which is $3.20 PPP, or upper middle income, five fifty. dollars you see that the statistical capacity in this regression does not explain anything. 
what matters is the level of income of the country and schooling. Uh, next slide, please. So let me uh, uh, indulge you, uh, or please indulge me in uh, one of my pet peeves, which is studying Iran's poverty rate and being very frustrated that it has had very little impact on uh, public debate. Uh, so I'm asking, can more and better data improve the public debate over poverty? To start with, in 2014, uh, collaborating with Aziz and his colleagues at the World Bank, uh, we published a paper 20, in 2016 that for 2014 estimated Iran's poverty rate at 10% using the 550 uh, for upper middle income countries. And this data is available on the WDI, you type in uh, this particular study, it comes up. Yet, the public debate about Iran's poverty, which has become hugely political because the Trump administration has been trying to say that Iran is a failed state, specifically on poverty, and therefore uh, deserves sanctions and then deserves regime change. Uh, an, an example of this is an article that was published, an op-ed in the New York Times by a professor from Sweden about how the other half lives in Iran. And I have a quote here from it. Every year, more Iranians are classified as poor. Official sources report in 2015 that 40% of Iranians lived below the poverty line. Now, there's at least three things wrong with this statement. First of all, Iran has data every year, as Aziz has mentioned, is one of the richer countries in terms of uh, household budget surveys. And uh, the author hasn't used it. And uh, the uh, official sources do not report poverty rates. That's very well known because Iran does not have a poverty line. And the government deals with poverty outside this data. It's in, in, in its own way. And thirdly, this reference it gives it is not at all accurate. If you click on that, and remember, this is New York Times, all the news that fits to print, the news of record. It links to an obscure health news website uh, called Salamat News that quotes an Iranian acad academic who uses a poverty line of about $10 PPP per person per day, which naturally gets 40%. That's about the middle class line, as far as I know. Next slide, please. And I believe this is my last slide. Yes, so what do we learn from Iran's case? As I mentioned, Iran has good HBS data. 35 consecutive years of it are publicly available. Not easy to uh, use because the government doesn't put any resources in making them user-friendly, but you can download the raw data and then you're on your own. Uh, but the data has failed to improve the quality of the public debate, nor established even a national poverty line so that people can debate the poverty status with a particular uh, poverty line so they don't uh, jump all, all over the place moving the poverty line up and down. You know, when Ahmadinejad brought cash transfers, poverty line failed. That's another thing that the uh, Atavan of paper shows. Uh, but Iranians move the poverty line up and write in their own journals, newspapers, that poverty has improved under Ahmadinejad. It's become highly political, and the data has been quite ineffective in uh, taming that. So how did Iran actually reduce its poverty rate having such a poor debate over poverty? It came down from 40% in 1980s to around 10% in the last two decades. The answer, if you ask the older generation of development economists is simple, is public infrastructure. Better distribution of public infrastructure. Iran's case actually questions the emphasis placed on data in this evidence-based movement with all the RCTs that suggests a bigger role uh, and that suggests that you need to have a lot of rich data, specific RCTs to find out all the things that help reduce poverty. Iran's story is a very different one. It suggests a bigger role for politics in adopting well-known pro-poor policies. When you have a revolution, the politics moves in favor of the uh, lower middle class and the poor, and poor 
proper policies are adopted. These policies do not require a lot of testing to identify. Improve access to infrastructure, build roads, extend electricity and clean water to the poor areas, establish health clinics, and establish schools. And I believe that's the last slide. And I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Shavad, for those, for those remarks. Um, I'm going to now hand over to uh, Paul. OK, so uh, <laughs> uh, are we going without slides? Yeah, OK. So uh, first of all, I, I enjoyed very much uh, reading the paper. And I, I will not uh, go over the paper again, since it has just been presented. Um, and it presents a clear picture of uh, data availability and accessibility in the region. Uh, and uh, why is this an issue? Uh, and on this, I will probably disagree a little bit with uh, Javad. Uh, I, here I will uh, quote uh, uh, Aziz's uh, supervisor. Uh, Hans Hulven has uh, written yesterday that uh, in, a, in, a, in a blog that without good micro data, politicians are forced to make decisions based on anecdotes, gut feeling, and intuition. And uh, this is my strong belief. Um, what people can do with data, they can evaluate policy. I've just read a very good paper from Javad and another co-author on the impact on the cash transfer program that was implemented uh, in Iran. And because Iran has good data, uh, they were uh, able uh, to use uh, a natural experiment because some people were not able to register on time. And then they were able to identify the impact of this, uh, the causal impact of this ca uh, cash transfer program. And this is what researcher can do with the data. And then, of course, there is this missing link between the research production and the public debate. Uh, and probably we're responsible for that in, in, <laughs> in part. If uh, uh, non-research version are, are uh, more um, available than what researchers are actually producing, um, then it may be an issue. Um, uh, in the paper, they also describe interesting and useful alternative to cope with this lack of data. Uh, uh, my quarter and I have used uh, the Arab Barometer Survey uh, for a paper in Lebanon. Uh, it's, it may be useful, but still, it's not the best thing. And even imputation, it's as good as your assumptions are, uh, and as good as the model are, uh, is. So um, the best way, and this is what they conclude in, in their paper, is to get more uh, household-based uh, survey data. And I agree with the author. Now my question is, if this is an issue, then uh, what, should we, what, what should we do? Where should we go now? Uh, so we have some countries that have more data available, and we have countries that are reluctant. Um, let me take the case of Lebanon. So you have countries that share their data, and Lebanon is not sharing their data. Lebanon has a kind of tradition of free press. So it's kind of why aren't they sharing the data? So we need to understand the reason that is underlying that. So my idea is, did you survey policy, uh, policymakers? Did you survey uh, people in, uh, res uh, that have responsibilities in statistical agency to understand why, uh, they, <laughs> why are, uh, are, uh, they are not producing data? Or why, if they are producing data, they are not producing frequently data? Or why they're not sharing the data? And we need to understand that. It's a social question. It's a, and as any social question, we, we need to look into that. Um, and if we do that, there are many potential answers. One of the potential answers is that they think it's not useful. It's not useful. Uh, and then if it's the case, it's a very simple uh, it's very simple. We have a duty to educate and inform them about the importance of evidence-based policy to achieve a policy target. And you, we can easily use, uh, I'm, I'm quoting the example because Javad is there, Javad's paper and saying, look at this paper. They're able to identify in Iran the impact of a cash transfer policy that, that was aimed at alleviating the impact of uh, reduction in subsidies. And um, and it was unconditional and look at the impact, the impact on the structure of consumption and probably the long-term impact on poverty. And this is how we should use that. But maybe it's not because they don't think it's useful. Maybe they are worried about privacy issues. Uh, you know, even here in Canada, if I want to work with uh, uh, tax data, 
they will never send me the text data in my office. I need to go to a data center. And everything that I do there is outside the internet. And everything that is produced need to be <laughs> vetted before I can take it out of the data center. So maybe we can think of something like this for researchers in the Middle East. Uh, maybe ERF can have a data center based in Cairo. Uh, if uh, some countries, uh, of course, it's the Middle East. So if it's in Cairo, some countries may be afraid. So maybe we can have more than a data center. And if it's a, a, a big issue, have a data center at the World Bank or have a data center in a university, uh, maybe in Europe, uh, uh, where every, uh, every country will trust the data confidentiality of this uh, data center. And I think it's enough. I've taken enough of your time. and. We'll open now the debate with the public. Great, thank you very much for that, Paul. Okay, so um, we uh, we were interrupted by technical difficulties. So I'll give us a little bit more than the five minutes till uh, till the hour. We'll, we'll run over for we'll run for another um, ten minutes or, or so. And we've got some questions that have come in in the Q and A, and we've got a couple of hands up. So I think probably what we'll do first of all is uh, Shireen, if you're able to give access to Adam Ahmed and David Jed Schwartz, who have their hands up to allow them to ask a question. Well, we'll collect some questions up uh, and then the, uh, the panelists can respond uh, uh, in terms to the ones they'd like to do. Adam, are you there? Yeah, I am here. We can hear you, but please put your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, for the presentation and for the nice topic. I have uh, one question. I have conducted a survey in uh, 2019 for food security and poverty in Sudan. And I would like to make comparison with uh, COVID-19. And I have the phone numbers. Is it possible to use uh, the, the, the phone numbers and to call them again and to make a comparable study? This is one. Uh, in, uh, we have a problem also. You hear me? Uh, uh, if uh, there is a study conducted in, in, in the country and they have used different, different methodology in determining the poverty line, how we can combine this result? Because sometimes it is misleading. They use different methodology and there will be no data transparency to combine this result to, uh, to, to get the poverty measures. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, so we'll now turn to uh, David Jed Schwartz. David, if you unmute, you should be able to uh, put your question to our panel. There seems to be a problem with your microphone. We can't hear you. <laughs> well, well, well um, great. No, we're not getting you there. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let that one, uh, we'll let that one pass. Um, um, so there's a, question, there's a question, there's some questions in the Q&A that the panelists might want to look at. And there's one in the chat that I particularly picked up on, which um, uh, Mongi Bugala has raised, where uh, he asks, uh, you focused on using HBS uh, for measuring poverty and not on measuring inequality. Uh, yet there are major issues with that, mainly because of the underreporting of income of the richest decile. Um, so how can that be addressed? I think I think what I'll do at this point is, um, as Dees has heard a lot of uh, a lot of comments, so I'll, I'll hand them the uh, the stage as well, the platform back to him to to pick up some of these things uh, in the in the questions and in the remarks from Paul and Javad. Aziz, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for excellent excellent question and comments uh, i really enjoyed it uh, so i will try to answer all of them if possible most of them <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's be realistic so um, uh, let me first clarify so the statistical capacity indicator is not only focused on hbs or lfs it focuses on all data it's a composite index uh, i'm looking at the website right now so it basically depends on methodology data sources periodicity and timeliness so it's a bunch of things GDP is included, current account, CPI, etc. So it's a it's a very broad indicator, but we try to overcome it and focus on HBS as well, only on HBS to assess availability and everything. Uh, 
my picture was very gloomy and I fully agree with Javad's situation is improving in MENA, was improving during the last, I would say, 10 years. So because I focused on, on a snapshot and I compared MENA with other regions, which were also improving. So if you compare MENA with other regions, situation is not so good. But if you compare MENA now and MENA 10 years ago, there's a huge difference. That's, that's for sure. I, 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 don't, I, want, I don't want to down, down sign this. It's, it's, it's true. And I, I worked in MENA for six years and I already see the positive dynamics. More countries share the data, more surveys are collected, but it still is not enough. That was probably our main, our main message. Um, in terms of uh, data sharing, uh, Lebanon is breaking my heart because I worked on Lebanon for many years and Lebanon does not share the data and we, I talked with the statistical agency a lot about this. So we are trying to convince them to share the data. So the official reason not to share the data is the law which prohibits to share the private, private information. Uh, some countries use other reasons. So what we, we are trying to do, so we, we tried to, for one, once in 2016, we brought all statistical agencies to, to friends to discuss the issues of data access. So we try to bring people from Mexico, to, from Indonesia, just to show, and we also have uh, some champions in the region, the countries which share the data. So we, we kind of, we want to, we convince, we want to convince uh, stats agencies that sharing the data is absolutely must. And we also try to help countries to, to share the data by introducing to an anonymization tools, to, uh, by introducing to, for, to tools which allow to share the data through the data catalogs. So we are working, we are working on it. But apparently there are some countries where we should work more. Uh, in terms of the question on inequality and in HBS, yes, HBS are not good for measure inequality because top earners are not captured. There are a couple of techniques how to combine HBS with uh, administrative data to better measure inequality. And I think I responded and I, I, I sent the link to one of the paper published by, by our colleagues. Uh, in terms of the question to Adam about Sudan, yes, you can, you can call people every month and you can compare results. So that's what we are going to do at the World Bank. So we are trying to set up uh, phone surveys, so we will try to call the same people if possible. So it will be a panel and we will try to measure the impact of COVID over time. So it is possible. Um, well, let me see other questions. Um, uh, there was a question how to use big data to improve HBS. You can use it and people do it. So basically they use satellite images to update the sample frame and to get more updated uh, population numbers. So this is done and you can Google and you will find a lot of information about this. Uh, just uh, before I forget, so in Lebanon, uh, even though it's very liberal and free country, the issue is with data sharing is related to the politics because uh, a pol uh, a politician, the, the power between uh, different religious group is shared depending on the size of the of the group. So uh, that's why Lebanon didn't conduct census for, I think for 100 years. So there is a, there is a political, there are political issues related, not for, uh, which, which explains why data is not shared in Lebanon. Um, I am looking at other questions. Mm. Yeah, I think I... You've, you've done a pretty comprehensive job there, Aziz. That's, that's excellent. You've, you've, you've <laughs> taken on what Paul and Javad had to say. You've taken on the Q&A and the comments in the chat. Uh, on the question of uh, phone service that you mentioned, I've just put a link in the chat to your mm -hmm. colleague's piece uh, that we have on, on them at, on, on mm -hmm. the forum, so people can, can read that mm -hmm. further. Thank you very much. Um, we should we should wrap up now. I don't, I don't know whether um, Paul, you you have any uh, last remarks that you'd like to uh, contribute to this discussion before we? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I uh, I had a question from uh, Javad in the in the in the question.
question mark saying that uh, since I live in Canada, I cannot understand the region. Uh, as far as I know, Javad lives in Virginia, which is not far away from. <laughs> ah, it's not you. Okay, uh, but let me answer, answer that. I, I've avoided saying certain things not to offend <laughs> anyone, but I have one explanation for Lebanon, and it's related with Aziz's uh, explanation. In uh, the 1996 survey was leaked a lot, so people worked with it, and uh, religion cannot be identified in a survey. But uh, Hugo Panizza and one of his quarter use their knowledge of Lebanon to identify religion and directly by the uh, by looking at uh, where the person birth registry is. And they were able to, uh, to <laughs> write a paper on difference between Muslims and Christian, and there was no controversial issues in the paper per se, but they showed that they're able to do it. And so other people can be able to do it. And this is probably one explanation why now it's even more difficult than before uh, to access the data. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Javad, if you've got a last final remark, and then I'll come to Aziz for, la for a last comment. Okay, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to uh, make it clear that I would not make a charge like that since the charge is leveled against me all the time too. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to uh, uh, say something about uh, Paul's comment about the point I made about the link between data and poverty. I think it was very clever and gracious of him to use my own paper to refute my point. Uh, but I think uh, poverty is different than a lot of other policy issues. And I think when policies are uh, like focused, like does training help? We don't really know the answer to that. And it's very good to have better data. Data becomes really critical. Without it, you cannot do anything. And I agree that intuition, uh, often goes wrong and lets politicians uh, astray. But when you are talking about things like poverty, and I look at a lot of these uh, small data sets, RCTs done in very poor areas, where if you travel there, you see uh, sewage is running in the street and there's no electricity and all that. They are doing an RCT to see if they pose the question about insurance in a certain way or access to loan certain way they might jump out of poverty. And it saddens me because we know the answer how to reduce poverty. You need to have infrastructure. Middle income people, middle class people uh, are not pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps because cities receive a lot of the services. They have better schools and so on. I just wanted to make sure that the World Bank, which somehow leads the debate on poverty reduction, doesn't get too involved in data. And I also feel that bashing the Middle East has become a common thing. And there are things they have done they should be proud of. I think having decent living standards for the poor, not having huge slums like in Latin America or Africa is something uh, to praise. And to just say everything is wrong here, they have autocracy, they have bad data, uh, it re re removes hope uh, from the region, from the young people to appreciate some of the good things that have happened and build on it rather than to say everything has been wrong, so we need uh, revolutions and coup d'etats and whatever, uh, or foreign invasion in order to make progress. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Javad. Aziz, uh, the floor is yours for some final remarks and perhaps responding to Javad's point now. <laughs> no, no, definitely I agree with Javad. Um, as I said, huge progress was made, and I, I witnessed this progress because I work on data for seven years in Middle East, and I see it. I see how data becomes public. I see IRF. It's a, it's a great initiative. I, I use data from IRF. I would actually myself. I download the data. I read the papers. There is a progress. That, that's, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, I think we, we kind of agree. Um, so the... There is a lot of work need to be done, uh, and I understand that there, are, there is politics behind this and everything. But we we we, we try to do our best to, to to stimulate countries to collect more household budget service data, and then start from here. In our paper, we did not we did not. It was a very technical paper, so we did not focus on poverty reduction or, or anything else. But absolute precondition for 
any work to understand poverty is to have data. And I think I, I will stop here. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. This is um, this is the last uh, in our series of uh, e ERF World Bank webinars around data and uh, transparency and, and, and transparency in MENA. Um, but I should mention that uh, ERF will be launching a new distinguished lecture series uh, um, on the internet, and there will be an, a new series of ERF webinars, which will uh, be bringing the latest um, research, uh, latest on key research questions and. Uh, work of policy interest uh, to an audience. So uh, to watch this space. Um, but in the meanwhile, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for your questions. And most of all, thank you to our panel, Aziz, Javad, and Paul, uh, for a, uh, a fascinating discussion. Um, stay well, everyone. I'll see you again at the next uh, ERF Zoom event. Take care.